I'm so happy to um, introduce uh, Professor Francis McGlone, who I've known for many, many years now, and he has done wonders in the world of touch, um, both in research and communication and developing products and things like this. Um, just been remarkable, a remarkable person, a remarkable oh. effort. Oh, oh, I'll stop now. Well, I'm say, oh, you take the floor then, Francis, but I'm very much um, going to enjoy this. Thank you very much for presenting our final talk, Francis. Okay, um, well, thank you both for inviting me to do this. I'm, I'm going to take you on, well, it says here that I'm going to take you on a sea voyage. And what I want to do really is to pull back from the sea tactile elephant and just open up perspective a bit. But I want to start with a pre-COVID sort of history uh, where this touch problem isn't something that's happened over the last year. This was the furore that I kicked off after a, I gave a talk at a British Psychological Society meeting about eight or nine years ago, when I got into this, the notoriety of saying that not touching a child is a form of abuse. They're not good handles to have on YouTube. But this is actually part of that whole interaction between the carer outside the role of the family. And there's no harm in that, you know. I mean, the research has shown that that gentle touch on the shoulder can have a dramatic effect on the way that child behaves. So that woman, when it was her chance to talk on BBC television, said that that touch I just gave her could have been offensive. So, we, And she basically was instructing schools in South Manchester and telling teachers that there was that they should not go anywhere near their children and touching. So this, this rejection of touch has predated, obviously, what's been happening. And you can see some of the media stuff here that's popped out. So we need to recover touch. This is also an interesting... October the 8th, 1990. Indication. Just listen Kamabara to this girl. said about four guidelines if Common Prem touches anybody. One, if Common Prem touches comrades and tries to hug or hold anybody, especially her, comrades should warn her twice. If she does not stop, comrades have to go to the kitchen and get the stick and beat her. Two, pull her ears and warn her we will twist them off. Three, you will ask all comrades to join in and poke her. Four, he won't want to ever go anywhere near her, leave alone, touch or hug her. And that included my mum. She was not allowed to, we were not allowed to hug. It was so cruel because it's very painful as well. So I, sometimes I would wanted to have a hug and I, sometimes I think how hard it must have been for my mum not to be able to hug me at all. So you can sort of see there on those two, those two slides, you know, Katie Morgan knew nothing about the sea tactile affront, but you could see how this maniac punished and controlled purely by regulating the amount of tactile interactions that girl had. And she was born in captivity, by the way. So Rochelle's done a great job in basically giving us the background between the, the, the skin senses. Um, I want to obviously focus on the slow ones, but we know that we've got this discriminative sense. It's been described very elo eloquently. But the emotional properties of skin sensations appear to be locked in with the function of C fibers. So up until very recently, any medical or science textbook would basically describe C fibers as nociceptors or pruroceptors. And one thing I think when we base the functional properties of these C fibers, it, it's important to real, realize that in their evolutionary sort of journey in terms of the amount of information that these different classes of nerve fibers can process. We can see there the A alpha, the A beta fibers. A betas are transmitting information you know, as quickly as a Formula One racing car. So these nerves clearly have some fundamental role in alerting us to the here and now, what's going on in the world. And the C fibers, they basically send information to the brain at a leisurely pace. So clearly their functional properties dictate their utility in what they're there for. But interestingly, we'll come to this in a minute, by the way, but one of the things that needs to be recognized about the peripheral nervous system is, is that it not only detects events that are going on on the body surface, but it also plays an integral role in the integrity of the skin. 
that these two slides here show the normal epidermis in normal innervated skin. And we can see here that when a peripheral nerve is cut to a particular part of skin, the epidermis thins. So these nerve fibers are doing more than just sensing the environment. They're playing a fundamental role in the integrity of this little membrane that keeps all the bugs out and keep, basically keeps us alive. Another point before I go any further that always interests me is, is that this link between these C fibers and the brain, or between any uh, cutaneous sensory fiber, is that the brain is actually evolved from the skin. So the skin and the brain have an intimate developmental interaction where they, when they at the very start of, of development, these, these two structures are basically linked together. So there's a nice harmony there between the skin and the brain. So let's talk about the C fibers. Unmyelinated nerve fibers that represent a diverse population of afferents, and we're just talking about the cutaneous fund at the moment. And again, they've traditionally been studied as separate entities, and I'll come to that at the end of my talk. But here the aim is trying, going to try and do and seek a synthesis by reviewing and identifying some of the synergistic and sort of cross interactions that go on between, uh, between these C fibers. And another important point, by the way, is that if we look in a peripheral nerve, and you look at the, just the anatomy, yes, yeah? so how many of these different classes of nerve fibers are in a peripheral nerve? Here's our touch, our fast touch fibers here. And look at the difference between the number of myelinated fast conducting axons in the nerve fiber and the number of C fibers. 80% of the nerve fibers in a peripheral nerve are C fibers. Now that anatomical distinction must give us some indication to the, hang on, these C fibers must be quite important. And in fact, they predate myelinization. So myelin first evolved about 500 million years ago. And interestingly enough, uh, the structures that first became myelinated were the jaws. So eating was the, was the, was the, the actual precursor of, of myelinization. And of course, what myelin did is allow for fast movements and chewing, etc. So I just want to draw a comparison now between the, the look at the two classes. I will leave the itch nerve out for the moment. But if you look at the behavioral consequences of a nociceptor being activated, they're detecting external threats, they have localized mechanical stress, friction, noxious heat, firming. And what happens when that one of these nociceptors is activated, it provokes a withdrawal. Yeah, you pull away from it. And internal threats, chemical stimuli, gut act, et cetera. And again, when you've got that kind of, you know, problem going on inside you with a, with a bellyache, et cetera, they're playing a role to, put to you and to protect and look after yourself. Now I've used this word hedonoceptors, it's not quite correct, but I'm talking about the CTs. Now the external rewards that basically activate the CT come through things like nurturing touch, conspecific grooming. We've heard a lot about close proximity, social contact, hugging behaviors, and the behavior that these nerve fibers are here producing is one of approach rather than withdrawal. And we've got internal states regulated as well with chemical stimuli, oxytocin, endogenous opiates. And of course here, they've got a role again of protection. Now, if we look at the actual fiber classes that are involved in those two behavioral responses, we have the nociceptor, who's clearly responsible for all of these defensive reactions. And one thing I think that we may well find with our work on CTs is that in the early days of the C-nociceptor, there was just the C-nociceptor, and then many, many subclasses of polymodal and different types of C-fibers were identified. Uh, and these, the other fiber classes, of course, are the internal threats, again, when you've got sort of stomach ache, et cetera. But if you look at the hedonoceptors, the fiber classes clearly uh, are going to be classified as the C-tactile afferent, and the external rewards are dependent upon a particular type of stimulation. Again, with the nociceptor, there's a particular class of event will excite a nociceptor. And the same with the C-tactile afferent, they are tuned to respond to specific kinds of responses. And again, the internal states we can see with, with the, the effects of things like oxytocin and the opiates in the way that they uh, you know, drive a response, which is one of reward and pleasure. So this little video basically just shows what we normally need to realize that after that gentle touch, you've got the fast activity coming <laughs> nerves, but then you've got these little slow characters. <laughs> of course, what's happening in the central nervous system is that these two events are coming in temporarily separated, 
but nonetheless they are integrated in some way and I might mention again later on that the CT doesn't seem to be operating independently when it comes to the reward of touch. So we've had a number of ex explanations over today as to the functional role of CTs. Clearly their anatomy dictates certain functional properties, flow conducting velocity, variable response from stimulus to stimulus, and I'm going to hang out to this little statement because I can't remove it. I don't think they're in glabrous skin, personally. They're not pain receptors. And in fact, when viral are first identified this nerve fiber, it took many, many years to convince everybody that this wasn't some uh, low threshold nociceptor. And there was a great deal of work was done in order to characterize the functional properties of these nerve nerves. And Rochelle has explained that clearly. And just a little heads up that, that we just had a paper accepted in uh, scientific reports in terms of where these C tactile afferents are in, in the skin, but I think they're also in vestibular or uh, auditory systems where rocking behavior is actually having an effect on people's pain responses. Just keep out an eye out for that scientific reports paper. Uh, and as all of you will know, we've got this wiring diagram that's been worked out over many, many decades. As we know a fair amount about the peripheral encoding stuff, again, as Rochelle described with, with microneuropathy, We've got a fair idea of where these things go when they get into the brain um, in terms of the networks that are activated. But we've still got a lot of knowledge about where these things go when they get into the spinal cord. I just want to tap into looking at pain now, a study that I did with a colleague of mine, Andy Marshall, where all the evidence would point to the fact that the CT came into the central nervous system and up to the brain in the same pathway as the um, as nociceptors, i.e. the spinal thalamic tract. So this study, again, everything about the CT just throws a curveball, a curveball your way. You never really, you know, whatever you predict, it never seems to always work out. In these procedures called uh, anaphylactal cordotomy, uh, these are carried out for people in intractable pain, which is obviously not, not treatable with opioids, etc. Always done these days in terminal patients um, because things come back. But basically, you cut the wire, you cut that tract, and then you look at these patients afterwards and you measure their pain responses and their itch responses, and pain and itch are completely gone. So what we would have predicted is that affective touch would have gone as well. And of course, <laughs> we find the opposite. These people are still able to respond to the pleasantness of a stroking touch on the body part that's been denervated with the other C fibers of pain and itch, and we are working on why that is. Again, to build this bridge between these two classes of nerve fibers, this is a study I did with Rebecca Slater in Oxford, where I came across a poster at the Buenos Aires pain meeting many years ago, where they developed an event-related potential measure of recording the a nociceptive response from the baby's scalp in response to a heel lance. Now, clearly, you can't ask a term baby what to fill in a visual analog scale or a questionnaire. So this idea of using this ERP was a way of looking at the integrity of the nociceptive system in term infants. And what I convinced them to do was to stroke the leg of this baby at the CT preferred velocity or the non-CT preferred velocity. And this is two years work actually, and it nearly fell over at some stage. It was only because of the commitment of the people that were doing this. Anyway, the bottom line here, and this is stuff that Hokan and Jacquette have, have, have shown in other areas with pain a, a few years ago, is if we look at the ERP to the brushing stroking of the leg prior to the heel lance, we see that what's happening here is that the CT optimal stimulus is reducing the nociceptive event-related potential. So here again, we see that these C fibers aren't separate in terms of the channels that they're taking into the central nervous system. Now, where this process is happening, we don't know, because interestingly, if we look, we also measured with EMG, the withdrawal response from the baby's leg. So when you put the heel lance in, obviously it creates a, a withdrawal. So dependent on whether this was 30 or three, the, the EMG response was still there. Kind of giving an indication that this, where, whether this is a spinal or supraspinal mechanism, we don't know. But clearly 
the development of pain in babies is absolutely fundamental. It wasn't that long ago, actually, in the 1970s or 80s, where they were operating on babies without anesthetics, because the view was that they didn't actually feel pain. But let's jump from the other, from my other favourite, the C5 of the pruroreceptor. And itch has always fascinated me, as, uh, as Rochelle and others will know. But what's always, I think, sort of puzzled me is why scratching an itch for most people is so obsessively pleasant. Um, and the way around this, of course, was to test a patient of ours that we've worked with and many others who have basically lost all their A beta nerve fibers and only have C fibers. So if we just look at the kind of ways that we use to activate pruroreceptors, here again, we're now putting something quite, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we can say that's an irritant stimulus. You know, and the one we normally use is histamine. The, the point of this slide here again is to show you how these C fibers are playing a fundamental role in protection. Again, I'm, my main point here is that C fibers have a fundamental role to protect. That's, their, that's what they do with the C pruroreceptor, the nociceptor, the donoceptor. So all of these events after, let's say you've been stung by a bee or a gnat, are basically activating a whole load of processes, all governed and mediated by C fibers. But why is the scratch rewarding? Well, I got um, some interesting media coverage with my good friend and colleague, Gil Yosipovich, where we had a paper where we published, where it was most uh, rewarding to scratch an itch. Uh, that eventually got picked up and we won the Ig Nobel Prize. Um, and what drove this study really was this understanding of why scratching an itch. If you scratch your skin now, yeah, it, it'll actually feel quite uncomfortable. If I ionteprease histamine into that same part of skin and you scratch it again, for most people, it would be really nice. What's happened? Why has you know, something unpleasant turned into something very pleasant? Well, we know that C5 is generally a co sensation with the positive valence. Uh, so I was looking at whether there was a role from the C tactile afferent possibly in generating that pleasant response. And of course our target a person with all of this is, is the wonderful Ian Waterman. And Ian Waterman, as many of you know, has, has no myelinated nerve fibers. So he's our knockout model. And what we did, this is a study I did with, with Adash McDonald, my, my PhD student, is that we basically tested Ian's ability to actually feel any kind of touch on his body. And clearly he doesn't. And if you look at the response to histamine or courage and people's response in healthy in healthy uh, individuals, clearly when they're scratching that itch-induced body part, they're basically scoring a very high level of reward. And guess what? Ian Waterman, who previously couldn't feel anything on his skin, as soon as we've activated his pluroreceptors, he then got a sense of reward. Now, the only potential peripheral nerve fibers that can be providing that central state of reward, we don't know, but there's an inference here that there may be some role the C tactile afferent in some recognition that something is going on in Ian's body where before he would have no knowledge of anything touching his body at all. So another study that again uh, was, I published with a colleague of mine, uh, Susanna Walker, and a colleague in Valparaiso, and I was out there a few years ago. Um, I met this um, character, Alexi Dagnado, who had a lab basically built around stress models in rodents. He had no idea what a CLTM was until I uh, alerted him to the fact. And I convinced, this is another two years work, by the way, I convinced Alexis that he should basically take some of his rats and stroke them at five centimeters per second per day. We didn't know what the CT, CLTM preferred velocity was, but this links back with Zotterman's original observations stroking across a cat. So we had a rough idea. Basically what's happening here is that every day for two weeks, one group of rats is lifted out of their cage and just for 10 minutes, they're stroked at this, what we assumed is the CLTM velocity. Another group of rats were lifted out of their cages and they were stroked at 30. And there was a control group and a group that got nothing. Over two weeks, they were subjected to a chronic mild stress paradigm. So, you know, a busy, hectic two weeks, the smell of cats, lights coming on, et cetera. And at the end of that two weeks, we tested these animals in, in some acute stress tests. 
And look at this. These animals that had the five centimeters per second stroking touch just for 10 minutes every day were as resilient to this stressor as animals that had no stress at all. Those that got stroked at 30 centimeters per second or in stress environments, they're, they're, they, they basically, their cortisol levels were through the roof. I mean, all this data is published, by the way, but all I want to point out here is just that 10 minutes of stroking touch over a two week period uh, created a, a sense of resilience with all of these tests. So the elevated maze, the open field, you know, these animals had a minimal amount of tactile interaction, you know, by a lab technician. And we see all these behavioral effects of resilience to stress. So post COVID, we should all be possibly stroking each other. Um, the other thing I want to finish off really is my interest now in how who we are is shaped by what happened to us as we were developing. Um, so a large amount of our personality, our reactions, our, our who we are can be shaped in the early stages of development. And we've got some obviously clear examples of where that goes wrong uh, with things like the Romanian orphanages. But this comes into the work that Michael Meany was doing a number of years ago without any recognition for mechanisms. Of course, what Michael Meany showed is that if you're lucky enough to have a high licking grooming mother, again, we get this measure of stress. Your resilience to stress and, and other aspects of, of a busy life are actually coped with very well, whereas you've got a low licking grooming mother, you're not going to fare too well as an adult. And again, you know, these are behavioral epigenetic effects, which are purely down to this little nerve fiber. We know also moving up to, to human mothers that, 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 that stress in pregnancy can have a, a negative impact on, on that child's development. And again, touch comes into this in a very big way. I don't know whether some of you have seen a paper that was recently published in the New, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, where the World Health Organization head of the newborn infant unit had over two or three years carried out a kangaroo mother care uh, study across a number of third world countries. Uh, and guess what? Those, those children that got clamped to their mother's chest straight after birth survived much better than those who are basically taking away through uh, clinical care. I won't think I'll touch on the autism. It's one of my little things. The variations in maternal tactile care have a significant impact on a whole range of quantifiable markers. So these C fibers, again, I'm driving this point, play a fundamental role in protection. And once you've got those protection systems in place, obviously you can then start you know, moving around, developing myelin. This is one of my favorite characters, of course, is, um, is the, um, the founder of behaviorism, uh, making these points in the 1950s and 60s that basically impacted on many parents' upbringing of their children, where there was going to be you know, if you touch your children, you're going to make them mawkish, et cetera. I don't know whether this video will work, but I was busy. I was in London a couple of days ago. They asked me to come down and, and look at this theatre piece where this theatre group have, have done this play called Skin Hunger. some aspect of touch. So there were three of these. I found the whole thing quite weird, actually, because they come through this plastic. I want to hug you. God. Um, and uh, finally, I let you know, we've had a couple of talks on loneliness. What the loneliness community have never really woken up to is that what lonely people don't get is touch. Um, so this is some wonderful work that John Cacioppo, I think, was, was basically started, did most of his life uh, was looking at effects of loneliness and what we know now is that um, what we would hypothesize is that the sea tactile afferent is not only playing a fundamental role in early developmental stages but across the lifespan uh, and what john's data showed that the odds ratio of you dying earlier from excessive drinking obesity you can see 20 30 percent the odds ratio of an early death and loneliness is 45 percent this is almost epidemic levels but i'm afraid what very few people have been looking at is the mechanism uh, and I'm hanging my hat out that this C tactile afferent is playing a fundamental role 
uh, in building the resilience that keeps you going longer and happier. And I think it, that nerve fiber is probably still going strong during Alzheimer's. So just get back to the touch stuff. Uh, we've seen these C fibers interacting with each other, but we've made it very clear today that we have a very strong basis for understanding uh, the role, the two roles of touch, affective and discriminative. And this is an interesting one that actually it, it serves a, co a curveball its social distancing, by the way. Because researchers from Carnegie Mellon University looked at the effects of hugs have on the immune system. And in fact, what this physical contact does is boost the immune system. So we've got a double whammy here in terms of having to be socially distant. So we're we becoming more vulnerable to COVID because of social distancing, because we're not getting, we're not getting that top-up impact of the C fibers on the uh, on, res on resilience and, and the immune system. And again, we have obviously the main sort of C fiber group that I've been a member of for 20 odd years now, the International Association of the, Association of the Study of Pain. Uh, recently, my friend Gail Lasopovich, we set up the International Forum for the Study of Itch. And of course, now uh, we have the, in and I think, I think what that puzzles me is these three C fiber societies need to talk to each other because these nerve fibers are not sat there in glorious isolation. As I've tried to show you today, they're interacting. And we've got a book. Uh, and again, that co comment down there is just how in integral the skin is as an organ, playing fundamental roles in many, many different aspects. And for those of you who want to go kissing, I'm afraid next Tuesday is National Kissing Day, so I'll be staying at home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Uh, I think I'm going to put us into gallery view so I can see all of you. And Rochelle, I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, no, as always, an excellent presentation. Um, a really nice uh, summary of of all, so many things that we know about touch. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, they can ask them in the chat on um, YouTube as well. Um, I'd like to maybe just uh, ask a quick one about um, the scratching an itch do you yes. think it could be the nociceptors which yeah, could actually yeah. be delivering um, the pleasant sensation as well is the way you bizarre, interpret it yeah it would be a, bar, a bizarre transformation wouldn't it because the nociceptor generally signals you know things that ain't very nice i mean the, i targeted the ct and, and it didn't really it wasn't as profound as i thought it would be but you know I mean, I mean, it could be a delta, I, I suppose, but Ian Waterman still has those, Rochelle, doesn't he, I think? Yeah. But the fact that just by activating the true receptors, Ian was then able to actually feel something on that body part, which he previously couldn't, and he reported it as being pleasant. Um, not excruciatingly pleasant, but uh, the, 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 yes, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm fishing, for, <laughs> fishing for an explanation. Yeah, no, I do, um, because I, we don't know how the CTs are activated as well when you when you um, apply high force and scratching is normally pretty high force and I we know, have no I idea. Mean, no, I mean you need yeah we need to we need more micro neurographers Rochelle. We need more mm -hmm. people like you who can do far more things to these C tact diaphragms and, and gentle brushing. But you're right. I mean we know they, they they respond to static touch. We know they do follow vibration to some extent and hopefully you'll be publishing some of that data soon. So, you know, we need to expand their repertoire, don't we? And I yeah. think you, you undoubtedly agree there's probably more than one class of CTs as well. Quite possibly. And I've this is something that, that we'd like to look into. Yeah, and we've got to be, yeah. but again, it's such a difficult thing to do. And there's too few of us in the game. But as you and I agree, we build the whole edifice on the, on the neurobiology. Yeah, Once we've got the nerve fibers mapped, we can then infer, you know, downstream or upstream consequences of their activation. Mm -hmm. um, we've got some questions uh, coming in. So the first one is from Connor Haggerty. Um, what do you think are the fundamental differences in self-touch versus other touch in relation to CTs? And this is particularly considering the pandemic and loneliness and people's need for touch. Well, obviously, Kirsten Moberg has published some very influential papers about self-soothing behaviour. And I, I noticed, you know, some of the comments you made about how often people are touching their faces. I don't think when you're doing that, you're counting how many times, yes? So I think we, I think a lot of self-touching has been going on. And of course, it, it, you know, it's activating CT. So it may be a very self-regulating. Yeah, whenever you see people frustrated, you know, they're, they're doing that. 
And in fact, if you do that, it actually feels quite nice. Yeah? So I think there's a relationship there going on between, you know, the, the, between self-touch and possibly you know, releasing oxytocin and, and the endogenous opiates of the kind of work that Robin Dunbar is very keen on promoting. I guess it depends what, uh, about um, kind of uh, the cancellation signal that you you will send out with your own motor action. How much does that actually account for the CT um, input? Because self-touch doesn't feel as nice, but it's very true that you know it, it does help. Like you say, oh, that does help. I, I, I have a real problem with that Ephraim's copy argument. I don't think it's pertinent to the CT. I don't know why, but I don't think it is because you do feel touch, yeah, and and it's it, it's it's pleasant. So that Ephraim's copy argument, like you can't tickle yourself. Yeah, that was Sarah Blake, or the, I mean, actually it was Larry Weisskrantz who first discussed why you can't tickle yourself with, with that delay. But I don't know, I think the CT, as I said earlier in my talk, everything about the CT is not what, not what you expect. Yeah, as you mm. found with all your microneurography, it doesn't behave like CNO receptors. No, I mean, no, don't they're you think very different. Ephraim's coffee, guys, it has something to do with the fact that we're dealing with unmyelinated. I mean, I know the itch obviously isn't with the same class, but I do think there must be something along the lines of how that, that signal is processed and how slowly it's processed. Yeah, that, that um, timing, I think, probably makes yeah, a I big difference. the timing might be, might be the issue there. Now, there's that magic 200 milliseconds, I think. Outside that, you then the Ethan's copy thing tends to fall apart, so there's like a window. But again, I think, you know, we need to design the experiments to test these ideas out. I know your group up the road in Marseille, you know, Bernier, are doing some fabulous stuff with mice for Shell, aren't they? Which is opening yeah. up a, a doors that haven't been prized open ever. So, that. and that's the thing we need to classify all these different things in humans and in in the animal models as well. Um, so, for yeah. example, you said about the um, the stroking of animals. Um, there is one paper, Fang et al. 2005, and they did actually show potentially that actually the activation for the animal equivalent CLTMs is very, very slow, maybe even at one millimeter per second. Yeah, so but, we need yeah. to find out basically. I mean, I would have been rifling Zottman's data because Zottman first found these things and he was stroking a brush across the receptive field of the, of the nerve fiber. And I bet you he was stroking it at, at the norm, as, I bet he was stroking at the CT per, per velocity just out of instinct. But I can't find the data in the paper that actually shows that. So again, yes, we need to look at that one as well. So, um, there's a lot yep. to do. <laughs> yep, definitely. I'm going to say Roger Watkins has got a comment here. That, um, he's just saying that the low frequency activation of polymodal no nociceptors does appear to mediate warmth sensation. So these could be pleasant. So potentially nociceptors, yeah. it's true that they could be... Uh, it could definitely be modulating here. And I guess when you change the balance with itch, it could be changing the input as well. And it's all the interpretation in the brain anyway. So um, no, no, I, I think we've been very sort of procrustean. We've seen the nociceptor with the pain nerve. So let's put a pain signal into it. And obviously they, they, they release endogenous opiates, you know, the whole consequence of that. And they change their phenotype, yeah? The type of LGD, they're very pliable C, C nociceptors. So yeah, Roger's, well, you know, probably right that you know they change their properties after they've been stimulated. So they're very malleable, aren't they? The C nociceptor, and maybe the C tactile afferent is equally malleable in terms of its response properties once it's been activated. Again, you know, we need to do the experiments. <laughs> yes, definitely. And um, we've got another question here from uh, Michael Egar. He says, um, wouldn't you think that um, the time has come to integrate touch research findings into the daily practice of clinical medicine, um, for example, in the treatment of affective disorders or psychosomatic disturbances? I couldn't agree more. I gave a talk in Minneapolis a few years ago to a group of dermatologists, and they related the case of one of their senior consultants was struck off because he touched the bloody patient. This hysteria of touch. And I know every, every doctor, any clinical person, you know, is, I, I think it's different in different countries, but they're all wary of the, the you know, there's lots of troublesome people out there that could quite you, oh, he touched me. Yeah, you know, you're guilty. So they're getting, they're getting very careful now, but it's very sad. You know, we need to, we need to win touch back. And the IASAT and social bridges need to make that case that we need to rebuild confidence in touch and not have it as such a sort of critically damning thing. But no, I, I think 
you know, if that if these studies that we're showing where that affective touch is playing a fundamental role in regulating affective state, bottom up, you know, you don't need a therapist for this stuff. You just need to be, you need to be stroked. So no, I, I think medical care, every, every doctor knows that they're giving bad news that, you know, the gentle arm and the shoulder means so much to that patient. But if it's comfort doing that. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree totally. Yeah, and I think this is one of the things that we want to um, pursue with um, ISAT is the link between the fundamental research and the clinical um, implications and the therapeutic imp implications as well. Um, no, this is something absolutely. we definitely want to do. Yeah, no, we have a we have a job of work to do in yeah. ISAT and social. Do you think we had some we had some nice data today to that goes in that direction, trying to distinguish between intimate, friendly, and professional touch? and what each of these means to us as a function of COVID. But I think just more generally, you know, whether we, for example, I, I, we, we're currently running a study on certainty or trust um, in the context of a, of a very fixed professional, uh, you know, medical situation where trust and certainty are already fairly well set. I know what my expectations are. I know where you're going to touch me. You usually tell me beforehand. Um, and that might make it actually easier to interact through touch in those scenarios. So I think we did see some really nice work today, um, already you know, laying that groundwork, but I think you're right, we need to, to push forward on that. To well, we've made understand. the point with contact many times, you go to the hairdresser to get your hair done, you're gonna to get touched. If you go to the dentist to get your feet, you're gonna to get touched. If you go for a massage, you're gonna to get touched. So the context and expectation is always you know, pre, pre warning you of the, of the social Although I don't know, I mean, sometimes, you know, that inadvertent touch on somebody, a stranger, it's not always hostile. You know, I was um, walking through Hyde Park a, a couple of years ago and some guy on a Boris bike tumbled and fell and sort of made a big clatter. And two drunken rugby players, about six foot six, shouted across the road, do you want a hug, mate? <laughs> it was a lovely moment. <laughs> do you want a hug, mate? But, uh, yes, I think humans do... You know, we can honestly interact with touch without looking like we're very, you know, we're duplicitous in the uh, use of this sense. And we have another question from uh, Jaya Hyung Bai. Um, he says, uh, "What do you think um, if what do you think if um, you can provide machine kind of impersonal touch at CT optimal temperature and velocity? Um, can that be pleasant as well as interpersonal touch?" I don't think the CT gives a shit, if you don't mind. <laughs> it's yeah. true. It's, I think it's <laughs> yeah. true. At, the, yeah. at the skin, anyway. The skin. It yeah, and at the skin, I think, again, we just discussed context matters. Uh, but, you know, if, if you've got a device which is gently massaging the CTs, presumably all the downstream consequences will still occur, won't they, Rochelle? I mean, the oxytocin will be released and endogenous opiates. I'm, I don't know. I'd say so, but it's the top-down influences, the, the situation, yeah. the conditions that you're under can be very, um, can definitely modulate it very much. I well, know there are devices now, aren't there, with these huggy bears and things that you can, there's a group in Finland that have made a little huggy thing that, you know, your partner phones you up and this thing starts stroking you. I mean, I'd hate to move into a world of automated touch, quite frankly. Um, you know, there's nothing like the real thing. So in certain contexts, of course, I think having that tactile interaction is remotely or vicariously, you know, or, or automatically. It may be the best thing in a bad job. But I think yeah. should to be honest, it sounds like getting a pet from today would be a really good yeah. idea as well. <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. I mean, that, 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 that's exactly it. I mean, the number of, I was going to say bloody dog, the number of dogs now that are clouding the streets in the United Kingdom has just gone epidemic. Uh, again, I don't know if it's like getting, getting a dog for Christmas, though. You know, once everything does settle down again, I wonder whether you know, we'll see lots of dogs wandering the streets looking for a home. But again, human nature is always fascinating, and COVID has certainly given us a window into some really interesting aspects of human behaviour. And mm. um, we've got another question here from um, Paula Trotter, and she says, what do you think the relative importance of C-tactile afferents and thermoreceptors are to the pleasantness of touch? Well, this was India's, mm -hmm. well, isn't it, Rochelle, that, that the CT and temperature sensitivity are like an integral in that they, they, they share some kind of, not evolutionary history, but that, that, you know, huddling behaviour, if you look at the evolutionary significance of the nerve fibre that promotes behaviour to keep warm, then huddling behaviour of all animals and all humans, by the way, um, always used to sleep together. So you can see some relationship between temperature and touch. 
again, it's that bimodality, isn't it, which came first. You know, in evolutionary terms, you just look at this argument I'm making of protection. Yeah, that all of these nerve fibers, once you've got the protection systems in place, you can get off your rock and start, you know, start exploring the world. But you need these systems in, in place first. So yeah, the temperature stuff. Well, you've shown this yourself, haven't you? I mean, it's just beautifully evolved this this nerve fiber. It likes to be stroked at skin temperature touch. Mm. Kangaroo care stuff, even more resonant, I think. Yeah. So thanks, Paula. Yeah, and I think it's it's an excellent question. It's something I touched on <laughs> this morning. Is that you can't really have touch without temperature, and even if the temperature is neutral, it's still a temperature. Yeah, it's yeah, still there is an exchange, and it's it's important. It can very much modulate if you like touch. If it's too hot, very much you withdraw from it. Even if it's pleasant yeah. or if it's cold, it's a shock. And I mean, this cold, yeah, I mean, modulates. cold hands are creepy, aren't they? A cold hand is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I have a cold or wet handshake. It's not nice. And you oh, know yeah. that instantly. Yeah. I was wondering if there's not something to do with um, sort of primary developmental phases where you need the co-location of these sensory receptors to give you a sense of inanimate versus animate objects where, you know, skin temperature is a really good indication that you're dealing with a human or, or animal animate agent. So I wonder if that, you know, developmentally it's, it's hardwired to begin with. I wonder how, how, how that then proceeds later on, because clearly there are these exceptional cases, hot stone massages being a really good one, where even extreme temperatures can be very pleasant. So where expectations are modulated or, uh, so I, I think, I, think I, I mean, my personal little bugbear is having a think about what these receptors do at different points in our in, in you know over our time over our time on this planet uh, and i don't know whether the the co-location of these receptors and how they interact probably does change whether it's just because multi-sensory integration has to uh, develop around adolescence um so i think there might be a big distinction between how these nerve fibers interact pre and post that for example yeah well again there's the sauna isn't it which is so fond of our scandinavian friends where they boil themselves almost like a chicken <laughs> And they'd freeze themselves. And that's maybe... But you wouldn't do it with a baby because clearly at that phase, they sort of don't have that ability to, 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 to mess around with these different inputs. So, yeah, I just, I think maybe staging our, our hypotheses as a function of um, how much this information is being integrated and, and processed uh, together may vary. Yeah. But I like that idea of relative contribution. I think that's something that definitely needs to be thought about. Mm. I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions that we missed, but I think I think you've been you've been scouring it very well. So um, I wonder if there are any last uh, comments or questions from those people uh, following on on the YouTube live stream. We've had some wonderful talks today, and there are lots of uh, questions about different methodologies. Uh, different samples and cohorts. So I think uh, there's definitely lots of uh, potential for discussion. Um, we obviously can continue for as long as people are interested. Um, do you have any other questions, uh, Rochelle, personally? Um, not, not questions as such um, at the moment, <laughs> but I'd just like to say thank you so much to all the presenters and all the support that we've had today. It's been, I've really enjoyed it and I hope you've all enjoyed it too. And um, yeah, we've just had such a nice range of talks and such nice information about um, what has been going on during this uh, difficult time for all of us. And so it's been great to be able to get together. Um, I'm gonna say we've got some, a couple of questions or comments coming in as well. That there is always a slight delay here for us, um, but Uta says, thanks for a great symposium. You're very welcome. Uh, we're very happy to have done this. And we hope to follow this up, like I've said, in the next ISAP meeting next year. And uh, Rita says that I think that touch needs to enter school education. And I could not agree more. I could not agree more. I've spoken to people about this recently. And like Francis says, maybe we can define limits for touch, things like this. You know, I'm going to touch you here and that's OK. But it's we know this is so important. And I, I very much agree that this should be uh, taught from an earlier stage, especially maybe with the problems at the moment we've been having. No, you should Google Jean Barlow's peer-to-peer -peer touch programs. You know, it has yeah. a phenomenal impact on children's behaviour and their calmness purely, like you know, like the rats. Yeah, that that study. I tried to do it in school, but we haven't quite got it off the ground yet. But yeah, my analogy is it, it's the new school milk. Yeah, post-war every kid had school milk because their bones weren't growing properly. 
now I think they should have peer-to-peer -peer touch because their brains are going to basically not have the same kind of resilience they had before they were basically kicked out from their peers over the last 18 months. And then the new school milk is peer-to-peer -to -peer touch. <laughs> well, we do have one of our hands-on uh, experiments that are currently underway is looking at uh, and high school students ranging from ages 12 to 18, obviously not peer to peer as COVID regulations prohibit, but at least thinking about touch and, and looking at gender differences across uh, this really interesting age group, uh, what they think about what touch means to them, uh, how much interaction they're actually having with friends or family members as a function of attachment style. So hopefully we'll have some data on that. Uh, and then we can proceed. I mean, we obviously are using some of uh, Jean's exercises actually in the app, but then we can maybe when things relax, start getting them to actually touch one another properly. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much, Francis, for your wonderful talk.